Hello, and welcome to Six Figure Authors, the show that helps you take your writing career to the next level. We've been publishing since the beginning of the e-reader revolution, and on the show, we share our own insights, and we also interview industry experts and other successful authors. Our goal is to provide as much advanced writing, publishing, and marketing material as we can and help you figure out what's working right now. I'm Lindsay Baroker, and I'm here with my two co-hosts. I'm Joe Lello. And I'm Andrea Pearson. And on today's show, uh, we're going to be talking about kind of some of the tips on marketing, craft, and productivity that uh, Joe and I were both at NINC. So, we'll, you know, we'll be talking about the various panels we went to. And I'm actually, Joe actually went to more of them than I did. And so, and he took epic notes. He actually had his keyboard hooked up to his phone. It was just going to town in the back of the room. So, we are going to ask him today. Uh, Andrea and I are going to ask questions for Joe on the panels I didn't go to. And then we're we have so much material that I think we're going to do a second episode next week talking about the ones that um, we were both at. And those were more of the marketing focused ones. I think we both went to Mark Dawson's talk and uh, David Gogrin, Alex Newton. And um, I think we might have Dave Cheston kind of in here and we'll talk about his stuff again next week on keywords and, and search terms and stuff. But before we jump into that, um, I feel like we've been, we didn't record last week since we were at the conference. So it's been a couple of weeks. So do you guys have any news you would like to talk about that's been going on in your writing slash publishing lives this uh, last couple of weeks? Um, I, my book is coming out next week. The one that the big launch that I've been working towards, um, that's pretty much everything that's pretty much consumed my life the last little while. And I'm really looking forward to being done with it. And I don't, I just remind myself of why I don't do big launches. They're not fun and they're stressful. <laughs> so I generally like promoting earlier books in the series when I have later books released, just because that is more of a monetary benefit than promoting a new first in a series. But, you know, I had to experiment and try new things. So we'll see how it goes next week and how happy I am in a couple of weeks. <laughs> No, that's totally understandable. And it's, it's why I've become a fan of writing the first three and doing the reads because you know you have some more books and you can have some good income if book one does well. But obviously, that's you have to be a pretty fast writer and really booking them out to, to be able to prepare three for a launch. Uh, as for me, uh, I... I'm you know, since I got back from Nink and I had a 14,000 word document of things I might want to try, I have decided to uh, do my first really big push into BookBub ads. I've gotten this far in my career without really devoting a, a dedicated advertising budget. And I'm also having like my worst month of sales in a very long time. So it seems like it's a good time to make a change. So this is based in small part on the, the Nink learnings and in large part on I bought David Gogren's book on uh, BookBub advertising, and I'm working my way through it. So far, I've got a 1% click-through rate uh, by targeting Lindsay. And for a first try, like literally my first uh, ad that I've done uh, since I started, 1% is half of what I'm looking for. So if I can double it in my next couple of tries, good for me. So yeah, most of my next uh, 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 non-writing time is going to be building those ads. And for as for writing... Uh, I am doing outlining for, I've mentioned in my, in my previous things, I, I'm outlining the next couple of books in each of my new series, and I'm trying desperately to finish the sequel to a prequel that I started many years ago. See, I guess we're going to jump right into some of the tips we got right away, because I want to <laughs> comment on the book bub, like why I'm probably a horrible person to... Uh, Target, which I didn't know until who was talking book, but David Gogren, I guess we'll cover this some more. Yeah. Next week. But he mentioned for those of you that haven't tried it, these are like the CPM slash CPC ads where, um, and then you can target an author and you want stuff to display to their readers, but you should target people who have been running discount promos for 99 cents or one ninety nine or whatever. If you target the people that run a lot of free books, which is primarily what I've done the last couple of years on BookBub, you may find that they have a lot more reach. Like, what was it? Uh, each person has a certain number of followers on BookBub. But if the readers are like way higher, because there, there's people who follow you on BookBub, and then there's people who have interacted with one of your ads in the past, and BookBub counts those as... Uh, a reader or, you know, like a potential person you can advertise to. But I have almost 100,000 readers or people who have interacted with them in my ads and only like 13,000 followers. And uh, David was saying, you want someone with more like maybe you have 13,000 followers and 26,000 readers, which might be indicative of uh, 
they're buying the paid stuff rather than just clicking something because it's free. So Joe, you might be targeting me and getting a whole bunch of freebie seekers <laughs> since that's what I've done on BookBub of late. I don't well, know. <laughs> I happen to be testing with a free book. So I think it's probably a pretty decent target in this case. Yeah. Well, you'll have to let us know how it goes. I've, I've kind of felt that it's hard to pay that much per click for a free book versus like going to free booksy and getting a thousand or 2000 for your, I don't know how much they charge $75. Andrea, have you done uh, the BookBub ads and played around with that much? Uh, my husband has, he does like Amazon ads for me. Um, he's done a little bit of BookBub, but we haven't focused on it too much. We haven't had a need to yet. So Facebook ads and Amazon ads are still working okay for us, but um, wanting to branch into them more just because one platform isn't always going to be the best platform to use. And I need, I feel like I need to have experience there so that I can help my clients because I do get people asking about them. So, but not yet soon. All right, cool. Well, one more tip from BookBub. I, I know nobody really cares about my news anyway. They're like, give us the good stuff. Is that they're coming out with, actually, I already have it in my dashboard. It sounded like not everybody does yet, but um, you're not going to be able to target audiobooks specifically. Like you can go in and say, do you want to do an ebook or do you want to do an audiobook? And it doesn't have to be a discounted audiobook. It's just, you'll have to figure out if you can make it work. I'm going to give it a try with my Star Kingdom Omnibus that's coming out in audio in November. You know, it'll be like $40, but it'll only be one credit. So it'll still be a deal to, I can just target Audible people probably or Amazon and Audible. So I'll be curious to see how it works. Um, one of the things at the conference was you really, we were seeing how especially like in sci-fi and fantasy, uh, some of the categories, audiobooks were really encroaching and eBooks were selling really well and print was really getting squeezed out as far as complete total sales on Amazon. Um, so something to keep in mind if you're, you're like me and maybe you've started doing audiobooks, but you feel like you could be doing better. It, it's probably a good time to <laughs> start playing with it and, and learn, learn that stuff. Uh, as far as my own personal news, Boy, uh, I, I enjoyed Nink. Um, Joe, you didn't actually mention if you thought, did you think it was like, because if we were both first timers, did you think it was a good experience and should Andrea definitely come next year? Or are you gonna, maybe going to go every other year or never return to Florida again because we melted in the humidity? <laughs> the, the humidity was a bit much, but uh, I think the information was really worthwhile. It was definitely sort of, I've only done a few author type conferences and this one was definitely sort of the highest level uh, uh, information we were getting. I felt like the community was a lot more accessible here than some of the others I've been to. Um, so as long as I can sort of still financially justify the trip, uh, I could foresee going to this thing on a regular basis. All right. And I enjoyed it. It is a long haul if you're out West to uh, go all the way to Florida. It's sort of like a full day of travel each way. If I did it again, I'd definitely go for a couple extra days and just vacation because you don't want to actually go outside when you're in your normal clothes and like going to be going into the conference. Cause I did that the first morning. I, I told this story. I walked to Dunkin' Donuts for a latte quarter mile away, quarter mile back. And I was just dripping sweat when I walked in. I was like, what? This is not my high desert climate. All right, and just a little couple updates in case you guys are curious. Uh, I know a lot of people experiment with pen names, and I've mentioned that uh, I'd, I did my uh, sci-fi romance pen name, and it, kind of for about three years I was publishing stuff there, and it's been about a year and a half since I published anything new. And uh, just a warning to all, if you happen to register your hosting and domain name under a pen name email that you basically only made for your pen name, so I made her a Gmail address, which I then proceeded not to check for like a year and a half. And I lost the domain name <laughs> because I didn't see the, uh, you know, the renewal notification. And so now I'm in the process of getting a new domain name because somebody snapped it up. So a warning to all, you probably, even if you're doing uh, the pen name and you want to keep it really separate from your main name, probably still get the hosting and you know, your domain registration under an account you actually check religiously and will continue to do so even if you stop uh, publishing books. All right, I will skip my last news. You don't care that I finished my current project. <laughs> and why don't we just uh, jump into some questions for Joe from the panels that I didn't necessarily go to. And Andrew is going to ask some questions too since she didn't go this year, but will perhaps be tempted to go in the future now that we've scared her with humidity. Is there any humidity in Utah? I feel like it's, it's pretty dry there. 
Um, no, it's like the second driest state in the, in the country, but I did live in Toronto and it's hundred percent humidity with hundred degree weather in the summer. So it's, um, not unfamiliar to me. All right. Here's good for your skin. <laughs> so, um, Joe, you went to, I think I'm going to ask you about the first one it was called planning for success, the writer's guide to getting it all done. And I guess I'll let you talk about it. We saw your notes, but what did you get away? This sounded like what did you get from it? It sounded like a lot of us are really stressed out and trying to do everything. So it's, if you're feeling that way, it's not just you. Yeah, it was, it was an interesting one. Uh, the, this was uh, Sarah Cannon was the person who ran this one. And it was uh, a lot about prioritization and planning. Uh, like not just identifying what needs to be done, but also figuring out how much time it'll actually take. Uh, the key thing that, that, that was the main focus was that you need to take a realistic view on what can be done in any given amount of time. A big thing that she talked about was that, uh, and it was a quote, there was, lots of, there was lots of useful quotes in it that I don't know if I recorded all of them, but one of them was along the lines of, uh, most people underestimate what they can do in a, in a year and overestimate, no, the other way around. They overestimate what they can do in a year and underestimate what they can do in 10 years. So a lot of it, which it was talking about how, you know, g give yourself the space and, and pace yourself uh, uh, w one of the big chunks that was super useful is they like basically looked at October, like October is 31 days. So divide your workload by 31 and do that much each day, right? Oh, except Halloween takes this many days and oh, there's that barbecue you need to do and blah, blah, blah. So now you have 21 days. So you now have to increase your, your average to fit it all on 21 days. Like instead, just be aware of how much actual working time is in the month and plan accordingly in that way so that you don't suddenly find yourself having to write 6,000 words a day when you know you can on your best day only do 4,000. So there was a big chunk like that. It was useful. And uh, yeah, like just in general, the whole thing was, was about just like knowing what needs to be done and figuring out what needs to be done. I'm curious if you two guys are big on to like planning and spreadsheets and to-do lists or like I know some authors will like know a year out, even if they publish frequently, they've got it all planned, like what's coming out in what's month. And uh, I'm sort of halfway in the middle, I would say. I'm not a pantser completely, but, you know, don't ask me what's coming out in August of next year. I'm just like, well, maybe a later book in, in the next series. Do you feel that you're more of a planner and do you find that helpful? Um, I am a, I'm a, I'm a day to day planner. I have a big old thing. Well, I have a, I'm sorry. I have a weekly planner. I have like a, a, f a file called day, uh, daily agenda and I have, it's broken up by, by days of the week. And that is useful just to, so they don't forget the small tasks, but I tend to really lose track of the long term. So this, 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 this sort of thing, particularly later on, we'll talk a little bit about how like it stretches out to like a 90 day chunk. Sometimes I, I got to get better with that. Andrea, I feel like with kids and everything, you're probably really a little more tighter and need to do a lot of planning. Do you do any of that? And do you feel like it's been helpful? Um, I generally don't. Um, this last launch I have, I've got everything set up and all the pre-orders lined out um, because I switched my writing style halfway through the last, um, since I started publishing. So like three or four years ago, I started dictating. And so I found that things didn't exactly go the way um, they were when I was typing. And so I had to readjust everything. And so now that I've got a good swing in now, I know better, um, what to expect. And so I've been able to set up my next, my launch schedule for this whole series all the way through June. But generally, um, there's, it's too hard to predict with kids. And with this schedule, I've got it set up so that I have a lot of buffer days and I'm not pushing myself too hard each day. So I'm only doing 5,000 words a day. And then when I get to the revisions, I'm only doing five pages of revisions a day. And then, so that gives me time to get a 50 to 60,000 word book done in about nine weeks, including days off and things like that. So, I mean, it's, it's helping right now, but I haven't done it in the past and I don't generally use spreadsheets. I probably should though. I always feel like I'm really in the weeds. If I catch myself actually sitting and typing out a to-do list, <laughs> like I got this, 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 and this done. Um, it's a good point to make some buffer days because you never know when you're going to get sick or something's going to happen. And I know like I have my editor booked almost every month and that can be kind of stressful if you're just like, well, I'll just get it done. And, uh, I, one of the things going forward, I'm probably going to book a few less days <laughs> next year. I have a little bit of fear of missing out. I'm like, well, what if I have something done? I want to be able to send it to her and I have to wait another month to publish it. <laughs> Patience is not a virtue or it is a virtue. It's something I don't have. 
Um, Joe, she talked to you about the 80-20 rule, which we've kind of touched on before in our old podcast, and, and lots of people have brought it up, sort of the Pareto principle. Do you want to, did she give some new insight into that or anything writers in particular might find useful? Uh, yeah. So uh, for people who aren't familiar, basically the 80-20 rule is that 20% of your effort will produce 80% of your results. And uh, a big, you know, one of our main things was like identifying what the 20% of tasks you should be doing to get the 80% payoff. And she boiled it down to basically, I, well, making a list of all the things that you might want to do. Uh, and then asking yourself the same two questions for every one of those tasks. And the questions were, does this move me toward my goal? Which of course means you have to define your goal, uh, which, which is the thing that a lot of people don't do. Uh, so does this move me toward my goal is one question and will it pay off significantly in the short term and is the other. And if the answer to both of those questions is no, it shouldn't be on your list. And so it's not definitely not going to be in the 20% if it doesn't move you towards your goal and it won't in, uh, affect you in the short term. If the answer to both questions is yes, it absolutely belongs on the list. This is going to be a high impact item that definitely moves you forward. And then if it does move you towards your goal, but not immediately, then it should go onto your long term list. That's, that basically covers everything. So yeah, those two questions and knowing clearly what your goal is, was uh, the way that she sort of recommended that you find your 20% of, of high impact stuff. Does this move me toward my goal? Will it pay off significantly in the short term? What does she mean by, by pay off significantly in the short term? Does she recommend not doing things that would pay off only in the short term? Or does she recommend doing them or only focusing on the long term? Um, with the uh, payoff significantly in the short term thing, it's, it's frequently like, uh, like that was a way to uh, identify, for example, um, if you wanted to learn how to do uh, a new advertising type, and you know that it's going to take you six weeks of dedicated effort to get that advertising working. And, and you also know, based upon your, your experience, that it's the sort of thing that takes a long time to pay off. Uh, if you are in a time crunch, that's maybe a useful thing to do, but not a useful thing to do right now. Whereas if you know, well, you know, if I, if I just dedicate that time to getting more words out, I'll have a lot more flexibility with the book release. That's a short-term benefit that, that will help you, which also almost every short-term benefit is a long-term benefit. So she was in no way saying that you shouldn't be focusing on the long-term, but particularly in moments of time crunch, and sort of a framework of, of her thing was that she had found herself in a situation where she was buried and had to climb out from underneath it. And in that situation, the short-term is everything. So uh, certainly long-term stuff is important, but if you find you're going to be sinking a huge amount of time that you don't have a lot of on something that's going to pay off maybe further down the line, then that was just a lower priority thing. And it wasn't an eliminating factor, just a lower priority thing. I would have to mention that uh, I think we're all going to assume that would you be better off writing the next book also has to be a question. I'm just going to assume everyone, this is sort of towards like your marketing maybe and other stuff like, because if you actually look at it, I spend like 90% of my time focusing on writing and publishing the next book. So I would kind of be thinking, how can I apply the 80-20 rule to that 10% that's like marketing time? Like, am I better off? you know, figuring out how to do book bub ads, is, it the is the payoff potential really there? You know, or then sometimes when you're posting on social media and stuff, I always have to wonder like, is this really, you know, are you doing something that's going to sell books in the long term? Or are you just wasting time that you can be put to something else? Did she have any thoughts on like, I, you know, I kind of was reading through your notes and she seemed to be mentioning a lot of stuff. <laughs> I felt overwhelmed just looking at the notes. And I feel like a lot of us as authors often feel this way. We, we got into this business feeling like, well, we're just going to write books and then somehow they're going to sell. Uh, and there's so much more. We're basically running online businesses and uh, trying to fight in an increasingly crowded marketplace. Do you have any just tips on dealing with that kind of feeling of overwhelm? Yeah, uh, like motivation was a big deal. Uh, uh, and also like motivation in, in, that, in this case being like keeping track of the things you've actually completed. Like don't just cross off, like it feels good to cross something off on a to-do list. But she was talking about like, like we'll talk a little bit in, uh, in a minute about how she's actually structuring her, her to-do list, but keeping, holding on to the completed tasks because then you can see, look at all this I did. Like those little things to keep you going, like the, the, again, gold star motivated is a phrase I've heard a lot recently, like just moving forward uh, when you succeed at things. And also making sure that some of the, th the tasks on your list are small enough to be completed in a timely fashion. Like you, you wouldn't, like she wouldn't recommend saying, you know, write the next book as one thing that's on your list. 
that's going to hopefully be, you know, write these, you know, these number of chapters or something just so that you can feel the progress moving forward. Because like, I listened to a guy on online who, uh, who was a maker and he uses the phrase, if you're making sawdust, then you're making progress. <laughs> so it's like, you got to keep track of the pile of sawdust you're making. So like her, her way of combating feeling overwhelmed is just being aware of the progress you're making. And if you can only take baby steps, make sure that your jobs are broken down into baby step sized steps. Okay. So, um, one of the things that stood out to me was she talked about how we're often driven by fear. Um, what does she mean by that? And how does she recommend authors handle it? Uh, so authors have a problem, like we have a problem where we need a pretty huge amount of time to get a new product out. And, uh, if things start to fall apart or if you start to fall behind, uh, it can be just terrifying because you, it's like, you see, you know, you, you're the next possible piece of flexibility is on the other side of a 70,000 word, you know, chunk of writing that needs to be done. So dealing with it, mostly focused on stretching your schedule out and including the buffer and just being aware of, of how much work needs to be done. Like, it was a very strong indicator throughout the entire thing that if you have your entire road laid out ahead of you, then uh, even if your entire road's laid out ahead of you, you can, you're at least not going to be surprised by your own workload. And there was a lot of uh, just monitoring your own progress so that you can set realistic goals in the future. So again, if you think, well, you know, I can finish this by the end of the month. If I up my average, you know, if I double my average, I can, I can finish it by the end of the month. Don't put yourself in a situation where you have to do that. Know how much you can write and keep track of how much you can write and plan it accordingly. So a lot, a lot of the just being driven by fear thing was being very aware of, of what you can do and how soon you can do it. And trying to, even if there's the unexpected, have a spot in the, in the, uh, in the sort of Gantt chart, so to speak, of uh, like, this is where my wiggle room for the unexpected is. And I put that in there for a reason. Because the worst thing that can happen is if you, if you put a buffer in that you don't need, is that you have a couple of extra days. <laughs> and that's a lovely thing to happen. So, so like being aware of and planning for, for disaster uh, was a big chunk too. Did she talk at all about how sometimes our tasks will, you know, swell or whatever the word is to fill the appropriate amount of time and how to address that? Um, there was a little bit about how, like, it, I mean, heck, she sort of acknowledged that even the task of making these giant lists of tasks was, was a thing, but, uh, 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 yeah, what basically she was very, uh, dedicated to, if it's not on the task list, you shouldn't be doing it. So like if you spent your time and, uh, and, and you made your list of tasks, uh, you stick to what's on that task list. And when it's done, if there's no more tasks on that list, then you add more stuff. So it was, it was uh, like the way that you sort of combat the amount of, the amount of um, tasks filling the amount of time is to be spacing them up into, into daily chunks that you actually complete and keep track of. And then you know, the better you go at it, the, the more often you do it and the longer you do it, the better you are at estimating that stuff. And it's a, there's a lot of discipline involved, which is something I lack. <laughs> yeah, I think um, a lot of us lack it. <laughs> um, okay, so talk to us about the, the, is it the Kanban? How did she say that? Kanban board, Kanban board? I what think was she that? said Kanban. Okay, uh, what was yeah. that about? That's how she organizes her tasks. Uh, and it comes down to like, you know, there's the whole part up front where you make your list of stuff that you need to do. And then there's the whole part where you separate it into the priorities. And then once you're done, you have this list of tasks and you have roughly an idea of when and uh, when they should be done and which ones are most important. So then she would take them and write them on like post-it notes uh, uh, that are color coded based upon what type of task it is and put it on a board and the board's broken down into, well, first off, the tasks start as goals. So you have goals, the goals are achieved by completing projects, the projects are achieved by completing tasks. The tasks are what go on the post-it notes. Post-it notes go on a board that has the 90 days of stuff I need to do as one section. And then as you pick a task, it goes down to the tasks you're working on section. And then as you complete the task, it goes into the completed task section. And that's where you end up with this big box of completed tasks. You're only ever working on the thing that you've designated as the thing you're supposed to be working on now. And you have a clear view. Of, I'm pointing to the wall, which is where it would be if I had one. <laughs> uh, and you have a clear view of how many tasks remain. And because you have the clear view of how many tasks remain, you, again, can't really get taken by surprise by the amount of workload because it's staring at you in the face every day. 
and you can sort of on the fly like reprioritize if you find that well you know whatever if you've you've got advertising tasks as red notes and like there's a lot of red notes in there and there's not a lot down here so I should move these over for today and it was it seemed like uh, especially if you're the kind of person who isn't great at like holding all of that in your head or or just if you're the kind of person who needs to at a glance get an idea of what you need to do it seems like it's a fantastic way to organize it but it also seems like the sort of thing that is an entire project in and of itself and uh, and uh, is maybe a bit more than I would do. So it's a great idea. I think I'd probably modify it for my purposes. Okay, so I've kind of done that before. She used sticky notes. Is that what you're saying, what she did? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so I've done that before. The good thing about it is you have a vis very physical and vis visual representation of what you've actually completed. And so it gives you that... Um, it's like kind of like an immediate dopamine release. You see all these tasks that you've done, you know, so that really helped me when I was doing it. Um, so we're going to go on to a panel that is it called Ninkovators? Is that what they called it? Yeah, they call it Ninkovators, which I had a really hard time. Uh, when I saw it on the thing, I was like, is this a Ninkovators? What's going on? Here? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what were your biggest takeaways from it? And I kind of, I'm, we, Matt Buckman, um, is that how you say his name, by the way? I can't remember. That's he was, how I say his name, yeah. Yeah, he was in, the, in our first year up at the business master class. Um, but he talked there about his short story model. I wanted you to talk about that a little bit and then about her, what she was talking about with the YouTube channel and things like that. Sure. All right. So Matt, Matt Buckman is pretty darn prolific. He is, uh, uh, I was going to say he's a romance writer. He's a lot of things now. He's been steadily evolving. I think he's into uh, suspense thrillers now. But he, uh, uh, and he told an anecdote about how it started, but basically he was challenged to write a short story, which is very hard for, for uh, a romance. But apparently, as he put it, if you make a box small enough that only one story can fit in it, then you, then you can fill that box with a story. So he was able to start producing short stories pretty quickly. And he put together a, a system where basically on exactly on the same day of every month, like clockwork, he would release a new short story. And he has a whole process now where the short story is available uh, for free on his site for a certain amount of time. And then it's available early to patrons. And then he's able to sell, uh, uh, you know, w once it comes off his site, he puts up a link, well, here's where you can buy it for 99 cents or whatever the price is. So he's got this whole, and, it, and because that process takes time, like it's two weeks early access and then a week of availability and then another week of pushing the sale, it's a full month of activity. So he's able to keep buzz going constantly amongst his fans. And it seems like, I mean, we talk about rapid release. You can easily, even I could easily maintain, even I do easily maintain a, uh, a short story a month. I do that now with my own Patreon. So it seems like a really useful thing, but he's been adding to it more because now BookFunnel lets you deliver up to two hours of audio. So he can now make, he's, he's now uh, narrating his short stories as, as short audio books and selling them directly through basically the same process. So it, it was a heck of a thing uh, to be able to pull off. As for Sarah Cannon on the, uh, the uh, YouTube thing, basically Sarah Cannon is the one who we were just talking about the, uh, the plan for success. Uh, she has a YouTube channel that's by an author for authors and it's her thoughts and techniques, not unlike the ones that I listed in the previous section. Uh, she also has like um, classes like, like things you can do like that. And she sells planners, as you might imagine, based upon her pension for planning. And uh, it's just basically a YouTube channel is a super useful way to build authority as a nonfiction author. But also, uh, you know, once you have a strong enough following, you start getting access to like, she's making money off of the YouTube, in, at least enough money to make it a worthwhile thing to do. But also because she's selling like planners as a product, she's able, she's contacted by sponsors who want her to talk about their planners or, or sending her planners to test. So uh, uh, it's sort of a feedback loop of, of uh, her being able to provide useful information and getting new useful information and having that whole process pay for itself. I'm curious if there are any fiction authors out there killing it with YouTube. If that's you, leave a comment, let us know, because it seems like it could be possible. Nonfiction is more easily... Like you're building a platform, you're establishing yourself as an expert, you got a book on planners or you know whatever that ties in. It's a little harder with fiction because you're not actually, unless you're reading your stories, which I feel like that probably wouldn't uh, work too well. They could. Uh, that's one thing we didn't mention that uh, 
book funnel, Damon Courtney, they've, uh, we're talking about how you can now upload up to two hours of audio in an MP3 file on book funnel. It's not yet audio books, which is usually more like 10 hours split into 20 different MP3 files. So they're still working on that. But if you wanted to record yourself reading a story, you could. But um, yeah, I, I, have you guys done anything with YouTube? I, I think about it every now and then, if only doing like frequently asked questions that I get from my readers and just having them out there. But I don't know if that would actually attract new listeners. Like who cares <laughs> until they've actually read the books, you know? Uh, I started my YouTube channel out for authors and writers and I had like 20 videos posted and uploaded and got a lot of subscribers and followers. Then I decided to switch it to readers and I did live videos from my Facebook group. I uploaded those and that did well, um, but not well enough to actually be like huge breakout. And so, and I've considered going back to doing more nonfiction. My problem is, is I've jump back and forth too much. And the videos of mine that do the best are the ones where I share my kids with my readers. And so, you know, that's not, it's not anything about my books and it's not anything about writing for authors. So I, I don't know. <laughs> I have uh, I have a YouTube channel. I think I have 75 followers or something like that, or, you know, subscribers. I've used it for questions and answers and I got a lot of, uh, for a while I was doing, I was doing them weekly because at the end of every question and answer session, I would ask for more questions and answers or questions and would provide answers. And, uh, I would get enough to justify the next week. And I would of course announce new stuff and, uh, that I was releasing. But once the question started drying up, I, my motivation, uh, for doing it dried up and it was never a huge, it was basically, just feeding the already ravenous part of my community, which is not a bad thing to do, but it wasn't building my community at all. I've also used it. I have, I mean, I have a book trailer uh, and book trailer. I didn't get a huge amount of uh, uh, value out of my book trailer, but it was a place to host it. And uh, I, there will be some more audio visual stuff, but I've never really devoted enough time to try to make a, a, a self-sustaining concern out of it. This would be one of those things you'd have to appraise with the 80-20 rule and see it because it takes a lot of time to do video, for you sure. know, <laughs> is it actually doing anything to sell books for you? All right. So I'm just going to ask like maybe one question on the next panel because it sounded like it maybe was more focused with traditional authors, the writing the breakout novel, or I should say the people on the panel were out of the traditional world. Um, did you get anything out of that, uh, that talk that you would be useful? whether you're for traditional or indie authors trying to maybe go from mid list to higher. <laughs> uh, yeah, this was, this one was three, uh, traditional editors. Um, I think the most useful piece of information that I got out of that was, uh, the, there was a section where they were talking about what they had done to get authors who were mid list to, to break out bigger. And, uh, some of it I think is useful. Like, one example was uh, uh, there was a woman who was writing uh, uh, romance and she was writing what we would call traditional romance and that, you know, it's a beautiful woman and a beautiful man finding each other. And the editor was like, you're not standing out in any way, shape or form with your stories. I think that there's a section of the audience uh, that is, you know, certainly enjoying the, the books about, you know, superstars meeting each other. But what about maybe there's a section of the readership who just want to read about a person like them who isn't a supermodel and is still finding love. And that woman wrote a, a, a book called Butterface, I believe, that turned out to be the most successful, uh, most best-selling book that they had written. So I think like information like that, where uh, if you can find the smaller niche within your niche, it's basically, it's not information we haven't gotten elsewhere, but finding a niche and, and or an underserved uh, audience and, and serving that audience works even for traditional and therefore is going to work particularly well for self published. Uh, and similarly, uh, and again, just good advice overall, a strong backlist. Like if your backlist is high quality, even if it's not selling well, but if you've got a reasonably large backlist, that's high quality. The next time you have a big hit, if you ever have a big hit, the next big hit you have is going to drive people back to your backlist. So as useful it is to really spend time honing one great big book that you think will be your masterpiece, if you just keep on putting out quality work, when you do produce a thing that catches on, the quality work is going gonna, is, is gonna to get stuff funneled back to it. And it doesn't, therefore, the thing that goes big doesn't have to go very big because you're going to be buoyed by your backlist, which will be getting you know, funneled back, especially if what you're releasing is, again, these were largely romance uh, editors. 
the way romance books work is you can have a series of romance books that are all standalone. So uh, they, you, any one of your romance books can break out because you don't need the backlist to support the plot. But the backlist still contributes to the entire series, and therefore every book in the backlist is valuable as soon as one of the books in the series is valuable. And it looked like in your notes that they had some comments on like, oh, you shouldn't write to market or you can't do this writing to market. And I bet all the indie authors in there were like, wait a minute, there's lots of people making piles of money writing to market. Did they address that at all? Or because we were talking about before I hit rec or before Joe hit record that, you know, can you actually become like a huge bestseller writing to market following the trends? Or is it more likely that if you get lucky and you do something new, you know, that, that, you know, I feel like most of the huge bestsellers have been not really to market, have been like kind of starting a new trend, but it, you know, I don't even know how you would say like, Oh, I'm just going to be the trendsetter and I'm going to write the thing that makes it huge and gets a movie deal. Yeah. A, a big chunk of what the, with the, what most of them were talking about was like, you have to, they were very dedicated, especially because of this, the slow release rate of traditionally published books. They were very dedicated to putting the absolute best book you can put out. And that means the book you're most enthusiastic about. So a lot of them were saying that you can't have a, have a breakout, uh, a book that was written to market because, uh, if you wrote it to market, then you adjusted, you know, you, you aimed your sights towards something which wasn't, you know, straight ahead for you. And therefore, it's going to implicitly be worse than if you had worked on something you were interested in. And but it's a good point. Uh, and first off, one of them pointed out that self-published authors can absolutely be successful with writing to market because of the speed at which we can release, we can catch a market even if it's brief. Uh, but I think I agree uh, very much that like you're not going to, you can only do as well as the uh, as the 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 market is serving. Like so, if you know Fifty Shades of Grey comes out, you can do as well as Fifty Shades of Grey, and that would be amazing. But uh, uh, you're not going to do better than it unless you're distinct from it. You know, you can't you can't exceed the market, and therefore that's what a breakout is is when it break you know when when it uh, emerges from the market. I don't think you're going to do that unless you're writing to the market better than the market already was. And I don't like, that's going to have to be what you're already into because otherwise you are an amazing person. If you can choose to do better than, uh, than the market was already doing itself. It's kind of like twilight. I mean, vampire books have been around for a billion years and vampire romances have been around for a while, but twilight just happened to hit th what the market wanted, especially, you know, the tweens and then the, the moms of the tweens. <laughs> so. Yeah. It, yeah. It's a situation where like, if you write twilight, you can break out. If you imitate twilight, you can't, it, you can't do better than twilight. Yeah. Uh, well, 50 shades of gray was originally imitating twilight. Just yeah. it, it differentiated itself. Yes. Agreed. Okay. So you went to a, a panel that, or not a panel a presentation. That was basically about the website and how, if it's pulling its own weight, um, what are the top three things you took away from that? Uh, the top thing by far was that most author websites are too complicated. And by most author websites, I mean, certainly my author website is too complicated. Uh, you can strip away a lot of stuff nowadays just because of the general savviness of modern web design and the modern web surfer. So like lots of us have a home button. And, and she was saying how uh, you don't need a home button anymore. We're used to clicking the logo on the top corner of the screen to go home so you can get rid of your home button. And then like little things like that, just trim away and uh, mindfulness of the fold is a thing. And hopefully by now we all are, but if you have a purpose for your page and you should have at most two purposes, ideally one purpose for any given page on your site, one call to action, it's got to be above the fold. If you've got too much stuff, forcing it down. And if it's a blog post, a blog post obviously can start above the fold and then continue down likewise with navigation. But uh, you you need to you need to get that stuff above the fold. Uh, another big thing that she talked about, like it was a bigger chunk than I expected, of the thing was the direct sales are are much more of a thing now than they had been in the past. Uh, uh, it's pretty easy to do direct sales. Uh, uh, you know, WordPress can you can get two plugins for WordPress that'll take care of everything from setting up your web. Uh, store to handling what the taxes are going to be and like giving you the forms you need to send the taxes. So, so uh, direct sales were a big thing that I might be looking into as a result of this, particularly again, because book funnel lets you sell little chunks of audiobooks now, which is uh, if you want to serialize an audiobook and it's less than two hours per chapter, then you can absolutely do it now. 
Uh, and finally, uh, and other people talked about this too, but you can use your website, like not enough people are using their website to focus things like group promos. Uh, uh, like if you're running a group promo and obviously it's going to have, you're going to have to direct someone, you're going to have to direct the people somewhere in order to organize where all of the, uh, the books are. And when you do that, uh, if you have tracking and analytics on your site, which is a big chunk of what they talked about, just putting a couple of lines of, of, of uh, code into your, your WordPress header and like a Facebook pixel and there's other pixels too that track stuff. Then when you, when you drive people to your site for a group promo or anything that you might drive people to your site to, you end up with a, a, a picture of your audience and you can use that to do things like retargeting ads or just find out what your audience is into and where they come from. Like, you get the additional data out of your audience if you are able to drive them to your website. So th that was a big heavy lifting thing that a website can do that I have never even tried to do. Yeah, Facebook will let you know if you don't have the pixel on there. <laughs> They'll email you know, you're like, did you know about the pixel that you could have on your website? And then we could target all the people that have actually gone to your website and care enough about you to have visited something. And I have to say, I'm horribly guilty of the website being too old, too complicated, and be, but kind of struggling with knowing what to... Because I started out blogging about self-publishing, and it's only in the last couple of years that I kind of shifted over to just doing stuff for my readers, free fiction and excerpts, and you know, here's stuff, new stuff coming out. But I, some, some of the old posts get so much traffic that still get comments that I'm like reluctant to bury them but I need to and just simplify and just have like, here's your blog. Here's the, maybe a menu for like rights. That's one thing I've been meaning to add, like in case somebody is interested in uh, acquiring foreign rights or audio or something that they can find that information, a reading list. I don't know about you, but even though I have one, I get asked about it all the time because they can't find it. <laughs> even though it's in there two places, it's like, yeah, there's too much. So they're struggling. And then of course the mailing list sign up, and that's probably about all you really need, like in the menu on that front page. I don't know. It's tough. It's on my to-do list, guys, <laughs> which I'll be putting on the can board with the post-it notes and darts I could throw at it, probably. All right, let's move on to um, Dave Chesson had a talk called Mastering Amazon's A9 Algorithm. And I actually got to admit that I, I've never really paid that much attention to um, what Dave does. He's got his own podcast and he's, is it Publisher Rocket? Is that what he has? It was originally KDP Rocket, and now it is uh, Publisher Rocket, yeah. All right. I need to get it, because uh, he convinced me with this talk, because I've, I've always kind of poo-pooed worrying about keywords for fiction, because so many times I've typed in keywords into the search on Amazon, and you look at the number one thing, like, oh, space opera romance, and it's hardly ever something that's selling, <laughs> you know? Right. And so I've kind of wondered, like, well, what is the point of even trying to, like, get up there in the rankings? But... I don't know. What did, what did you take away from it? He, he kind of convinced me to pay a little more attention. I probably will be buying that program to make it a little more easier with also with advertising, selecting keywords. Yeah. Well, I'll start by saying like when I said, yes, it's, it's publisher rocket. I said that because I opened up the tab where it is. I, I, I've, I've had it for a while and it's useful. It really makes a lot of the keyword stuff into like, we're not sponsored or anything. I'm just saying I genuinely do use it. It's useful for like, you can, look up who's using a keyword and, and it estimates how much they're earning. So it's a useful tool. But um, he had a lot of numbers and stuff that, that, that he would certainly consider proprietary and I would agree. But one of the findings I think was most like convincing in terms of working on your keywords and working on your indexing and whatnot was that basically f nearly 50% of the clicks for any given search go to the first three search terms. Like if somebody searches for, you know, like, Certainly not a lot of people are trying to find their next urban fantasy book by typing urban fantasy into the search bar. But if they do, the first three choices are going to get 47% of the clicks and the first choice is going to get like 25% of the clicks. So uh, even if you only do a little bit of work to make sure that you're showing up in the right searches and uh, ranking reasonably high, you're going to get whatever small percentage. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a do it once and forget about it thing. Whatever small percentage of people actually search, you're going to get a bigger share of them if you if you do the the work to get higher up in in the indexing. And maybe just to clarify, I probably folks listening know, but the keywords are just kind of like space opera might be a keyword. You know, things people type into the search engine or to Amazon search 
looking for that stuff. And they, you know, they can get really long, like six, six words or something that be search space opera, romance, alien abduction, breeding, you know, that could be a keyword for somebody looking for that particular thing. <laughs> Yeah, he had, he was talking about how like you know people would do a search thing where it's like Regency romance, Regency romance with secret baby. You know, like people get pretty darn deep into when they have a specific story in mind that they like, they can put together a big long list. And uh, the more specific they get, the more uh, uh, specific the keywords are. The smaller the pool of people who have that keyword, and therefore the higher you're going to rank in the, like the more likely you are to rank high in them. So identifying those big oddball search terms is useful. He also mentioned, I was actually at this talk, so, <laughs> so I'm like, this is what he said. Um, that like the goal is to come up, you know, put enough search for uh, these keywords in your like title, subtitle, you know, but you only need them like once in there. But he mentioned that like, if you put a whole bunch in there, you are probably gonna get indexed for them as in show up somewhere in Amazon search. It could be on page 750. But, um, and, but then he kind of mentioned that if you narrowed it down and focused on maybe like a few that were super applicable to your story that you might have a chance to do better, like it's diluted. Do, do you remember that or anything? have any comments about that yourself? Uh, yeah. What he was saying is like, uh, uh, Amazon will slice and dice the, the, the keywords that you have and have variations of them. Uh, and, uh, it will put together. So if some, if you have whatever, uh, necromancer as one of your keywords, necromancers will also, you know, it'll show up for that too, but it will show up higher for a necromancer as opposed to necromancers. So you could take the shotgun approach and put together a gigantic list of compound keywords and hope real hard that you're going to, that you're going to index and you will index on all of those. But the ones that are super relevant to your book, you want to be their own thing and you want to be specific with them because you will rank higher. Like you'll index for all of them, but you'll rank highest for the ones that are more specific. So he had a big thing about how don't just get scattershot. Uh, be strategic with at least two or three of your seven precious keyword slots. Because you can actually put like something like up to 50 characters in each one, I think, and however many words that is. So you yeah. could, in theory, throw a lot in there. Um, and in addition to the title, subtitle, and the keyword meta, or, you know, what Amazon gives you to uh, put in the metadata, he mentioned that um, a, the look inside might actually be factored into it. So however many pages you know, whatever it shows, the first chapter of your book. Uh, naturally, you're not, if you're doing fiction, you're not going to be able to put a space opera adventure into your story, probably. <laughs> like, we don't recommend it. <laughs> but um, the category is also, you know, obviously, if you're in space opera, click the space opera category. But he also said that re they might be looking at reviews and they might be looking at book description. And just to be clear, Amazon doesn't tell us most of these things. Like uh, Dave was very much parsing like the, not the terms of service, but like the tips that Amazon gives us for doing good blurbs and, and re, you know, figuring out what's probably used from his own studies that he does. But um, it was interesting pointing out that the reviews, now if you've gone to look at reviews on Amazon recently, you'll see that they start showing keywords you can search through the reviews like, you know, space opera, alien abduction, romance, which I'm just really into today for some reason. <laughs> it might be a keyword that has been mentioned in seven reviews. And so it's something you can click on to go just see those reviews that mention that keyword. So he thought probably if people are using them in the reviews that they might be indexed and, and weighted. Um, I noticed today I actually went and looked at space opera to see what came up. And there, the number one non-sponsored book had like space opera nowhere on the page. So I was just like, what? This is, I don't understand this. So I, I'm not sure, you know, and then the books, just book description is an area where in the past we've kind of said probably they don't look at this because like I had a book I looked up, like my character's name was Zerkander, which is, exists nowhere else outside of that series. And I searched for it on Amazon and it didn't come up. So I thought, well, they don't index the book description. But he, he thinks that they may look for significant keywords and just kind of dismiss things like that that nobody's going to be looking for. Um, do you have any thoughts on all this? I mean, how much are you paying attention to it? <laughs> Yeah, well, I uh, up until now have not been paying any attention at all, and that, this this talk sort of convinced me to pay a bit more attention. There's we got a note here which I should address, and if you don't know, uh, ranking is fairly obvious. I think we all know what ranking is. Indexing is basically just the list of things that your book will show up for if people search for it. 
So when we talk about something will be indexed, it just means that if somebody types that into the search term, you'll find it. And uh, yeah, it seems like, and again, if you look at down, if you have enough reviews, if you look down, you'll start to see they have little tag clouds of relevant terms that show up uh, in your reviews. And he was sort of speculating that like those might be indexed. It's hard to tell because they tend to be pretty generic. He was also speculating that maybe they'll, they're doing the same thing with your description, which would be why you're not finding specific things like character names, but you are finding, you might, you know, if you have, you know, rollicking sci-fi adventure, it might index that because that's the kind of thing somebody would search for not knowing about your book. Um, so yeah, it, like I think that, it, a lot of what he was saying was makes makes a lot of sense, and he had a lot of supporting information which we're not even really allowed to share because it's like proprietary. Um, but also, one of the points he made that I thought was interesting was uh, the look inside. Like, there is a portion of the frequently asked questions that Amazon gives that recommends that you have look inside because it helps readers, uh, you know, select your book or something like that. It is a recommendation they have when you're doing stuff. Um, and, uh, he's like, there's no sign that they're crawling the, 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 they might be crawling the look inside portion of your book, or they might just be recommending that because whereas it doesn't have any effect on the, on the search, when they actually get to your page, uh, they're more likely to buy the book if there's a look inside. So there are situations where Amazon recommends stuff, which might have nothing to do with indexing or ranking, but they still recommend it because, and this was a big point that he made, and we'll probably talk a little bit more about it later too. Um, Amazon mostly loves it when people buy something that was, that was found via a search. So anything that you do that makes your book more purchasable is also going to help with your ranking just because they found your book and bought it, which means that that search was relevant to your book. Now I've, I've actually used keywords and have had them work really well for me in the past. Um, I know it's a big difference when I actually you started using them and I'm not talking like the little short ones like urban fantasy, but yeah, the more specific ones, I downloaded a piece of software called Kindle Samurai that I'm sure some of our listeners will be familiar with. I can't get it to work anymore. So I'm not sure if it, they stop supporting it and it just doesn't function on later versions of windows. But I mean, his program, you can use his program, can't you to get, um, to get these kinds of keyword search terms and figure out which categories you should be in and things like that. Uh, yeah, you can use his program. Basically, there's like four different sections that his program has. And what, what it'll do is you'll type in, you know, what's a, what's, a, what's a keyword that might be good for my book? And you type it in. And if that keyword has got a lot of variations, it'll also show you all of those. And there's a little button that says analyze. And if you click analyze, it'll estimate how many searches uh, those come up for. Uh, it'll, it'll estimate uh, how competitive it is. So like people might search for something a lot, but not a lot of people use that keyword. So it's not very competitive. So something with a lot of searches and a low competition is very useful. Uh, it, it'll also, uh, you can then hit a little uh, competition button and it will show you what books come up from each search and how much they're earning, which is a useful thing because not only like sometimes you can get really successful on a search term that's not going to make you any money because the people who are competing for it aren't making any money. <laughs> so, so yeah, there's a lot of stuff that, that, uh, that the, the tool can do and that you can do. I mean, you don't need the tool to do it. The tool just makes it super faster. Like it, it gets as, as simple as type in a search term that you think is useful for your book and then hit space and start typing another word and see what the search bar autofills. Like that is just another, that's a thing that happens when people are searching for your thing and it'll give you an idea of search terms that maybe you wouldn't have thought of. And also sort of a side note, but, um, uh, he's don't worry about doubling. Like don't, don't worry if, if something is indexed elsewhere, don't, use up any space on that. So don't use words that are in your title as keywords. Don't use your category as keywords. Those things are already indexed by themselves. So there's a lot of ways to be just more economical with what you've got based upon that. And also, by the way, conversely, if you want to stuff your, not stuff, but if you want to include a subtitle that has useful keywords in it, that is a, a, a incredibly useful thing to do, especially if it's not clear from your main title or cover. So yeah. And that's a really good tip, especially the, if it's your category, don't use it as your, um, your keyword. Yep. Um, I like that. Now the program, again, it's called KDP rocket. Is that what it's called? It was called KDP rocket. Now it's publisher rocket. Okay. All right. Okay. Lindsay, your turn. 
All right. Uh, I just, I'm now I'm wondering if that guy has space opera for his category and his keywords. Because like I said, I did a search on the page. It was nowhere. And yet he was the number one. I was like, what is going on here? And now I'm also curious if the price of the book has any factor or they use the popularity list at all to, uh, to weight things. But because I know at one time I had like perma free stuff that came up pretty high in the search rankings and it, but it feels like it's been four or five years since those just kind of disappeared because they converted really well. Obviously they were free books, you know, and I don't know. I, I did want to mention for people that don't want to go and buy a software, I have something called, I use Google Chrome and I have an extension called AMZ suggestion expander. And that basically will just give you a whole lot more keywords. When you start typing something into the bar on Amazon, it gives you, it's good about giving you like stuff that might be before you know, and as well as after. So if you want to just go the cheap route <laughs> or, you know, start there and see if you get into this and, and really want to start reworking all your backlist and that kind of thing. All right. Well, let's, you know, and we'll probably see if we can get Dave on the show one day because, uh, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I would certainly listen to a whole episode on, <laughs> on this stuff. Uh, next, the panel that I wanted to ask you about or talk, I don't know why we're convinced that there were panels here. It, it was mostly people doing presentations. It was called um, How to Get Out of a Marketing Rut. Did you have any big takeaways from that, Joe? Or do, we, do you guys actually feel that you get in a marketing rut? I feel like there's every year is something different that I have to learn. And so it's actually, I don't know, stimulating or annoying, depending on your point of view. But what do you, what do you think? Uh, well, well, I certainly get in the marketing ruts and that I never really get started on marketing. Uh, but like I, I, I tend to cling to the handful of things that have worked in the past and that's definitely a rut. And, and I'm fearful of, especially when there's any risk to, uh, to spending money in a new advertising thing, I'm, I'm always very hesitant to get into it. So I, I can absolutely get into ruts, but the, uh, the, the talk was primarily about identifying a rut and its causes. Like there's a collection of different ruts that you get into that, that were listed and it's, things like that are uncontrollable, like disruptive events. The example that they give is maybe you've been writing in a niche and dominating that niche. And then there's a breakout novel that sends people flooding to that niche to write the next, you know, people start writing to market in your market. And in the short term, it's super duper useful because now all of a sudden your niche is in even more demand. But in the long term, it gets really competitive and hard to advertise the way you had before because everything gets more expensive. So like that's a, you're now you need to figure out how to get out of that rut or, other times, it's just something she kept using the term exhausting inventory, which I guess is the marketing term for you have sold your product to everyone who wants to sell your product to. So in this case, customers are the inventory. But like that's a rut you can get into. You've been doing a really good job and you've been selling your books, but the entirety of the available audience has either already seen your book and decided not to buy it or already bought your book. So in those, in those two ruts, then you, now that you have identified those ruts, there's the things you have to do. So if, uh, if, the, if the rut is that there's a flood of people that get into your advertising thing, you have to, you have to think about getting a little bit more uh, uh, focused in your advertising to the things that are specific to your book amongst the flood of new people in your niche. Or if uh, you know, the rut you're in is that you've overserved your audience their ads, then you have to start thinking about other advertising platforms or even just something as simple as changing the images or copy on your ads if you've had some long running ones that you haven't had to change in the past. So most, most of the thing that I got out of that was the problem solving thing. And I, I mean, it's obvious in retrospect, but trying to fix a problem before you know exactly what the problem is, is a terrible idea. So always take some time for diagnosis. It can be helpful with like the ads. You can actually see the effectiveness going down because you're getting some data on it. Like I know I might run something for like four months and I don't know if it's so much exhausting the audience. Like I always feel like the audience is way bigger than we, we perceive it to be. But I, I have found that like it's really effective for me to after a while I've been doing my book one, my book one to start put together the books one through three box set with a different cover and a different blurb and maybe hitting a slightly different audience. Uh, I guess maybe that would be useful. Uh, I don't know. Did she have anything specific like relaunch the series or I don't know. Yeah, there were a couple of things along the lines of, uh, of um, like, I forget the phrase. It was like refresh your, refresh your stock or something like that. Everything was very salesy in the thing, but uh, yeah, basically if, if you are, I mean, it, it sort of boiled down to the next book. Well, you know, the best advertising is the next book. 
a lot of uh, what they were saying was like, you can't always, you have to adapt to the changing market. And sometimes if your marketing isn't working on the products you have, it means you need a new product. And that would certainly be a situation where you're like, oh, well, now I'm going to have a higher price point thing. It's a bundled together thing, or, or I'm going to, you know, do a price drop or anything like that. So yeah, there is certainly elements of increasing your inventory to serve up to the inventory of customers. For those listening, it's super easy to get overwhelmed. And there's a lot to take away, even just this podcast episode. I mean, for Nink. Um, so like it's the masterclass, the business masterclass, their theme last year was simplify and don't get overwhelmed. So I feel like I need to remind our listeners if you get freaked out and overwhelmed, I mean, just pick one or two things that works for you or that you want to try out and don't, don't freak yourself out about it. Um, she talked about authors hedging. Uh, what did she mean by that? And what were the examples she gave? So just short examples. And then, um, what were her opinions on each of those examples that she gave? Um, so first off, like, what did she mean by hedging? Uh, hedging is basically anything that you do to sort of, uh, uh, it's a insurance against volatility and basically everything that authors do to actually make sure that like just general good sales advice is usually a form of hedging and it's stuff like writing in a series. Like when you write in a series, you, uh, you have the entire backlist that you can advertise separately if you need to, and you can always funnel people back to the beginning and you have a loyal fan base. That was, that's a form of hedging because it sort of dampens out the spikes and the, and the, the gaps by giving you just a broader base on the, on the, the store. Uh, release timing and rapid release are another thing where like, if you're, if, if, uh, you're afraid that you're not gonna be able to advertise effectively, rapid release is a way to build momentum. There's a sort of, it, not just because of advertising, but because of, uh, of the, you know, rapid release, allowing you to be higher in the rankings because you always have a new release. Um, just increasing the size of your library is again, uh, a way of hedging just because you end up with lots of little things that don't need to do as well. Building fan relationships was a, uh, was a, a way of hedging just because if you have a loyal fan base, then you're less beholden to the advertising platforms because these people will always buy your books. Uh, evergreen tropes was, was one of the, the hedging strategies where, you know, there are certain types of books that always sell. And if you can sort of include books, like if, if you're writing romance, it is literally required that you have a happily ever after, or at least a happy for now, or some people won't consider it to be a romance book. So like all of these things, are, and all of them are to a degree, uh, 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 she advises them, like all of these are good ideas. You shouldn't av avoid a thing that's hedging, but specifically, uh, uh, her split was 30% hedging, 70%, uh, uh, you know, advertising and things that are out of your control. So they're an essential part of your plan, but they should, you should always be sort of working on that 70% to try to wrangle it. Okay. So that actually makes sense. The rapid release being an advertising technique versus releasing less frequently. Cause I found that since I have kids, it's easier for me to do marketing because I can get taken away from it and not take 45 minutes to get back into the zone, which sometimes happens when I'm writing and revising. So I found that, um, with my schedule, I'm able to do marketing better than writing and revising because I can do marketing with little kids running around me. So that's good to know that I've been doing that part, right? <laughs> I would love to do it. To supported, you know? Yes, exactly. I would love to do rapid release, but it's really hard to get in the zone when you have, you know, three kids. And so, so I've been focusing more on learning marketing and stuff. And I believe Lindsay, it's your turn. Sorry. That's okay. No, and it's actually probably good that we have like, and I'm obviously more the, my writing the next book and putting them out quickly is the biggest form of marketing I do. But I, I've definitely noticed that with people that maybe publish one or two novels a year, that they tend to have to do more of the marketing side and they probably enjoy it. You know, it's definitely some authors are like, don't want to touch this. Why can it not just happen for me? Who can I pay to, to do all this for me? And others like, do you want to see my graphs and my spreadsheets? Cause they are amazing. So whatever you are too, or just whatever your life dictates, you may have to be right now at this time. And, and you can always switch things up later. It doesn't take long for kids to become independent and move out. Right. Just, just a few years. <laughs> then it'll be so much time. Yeah, I've got at least 18 years with my six-month-old. <laughs> practically around the corner. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that was a good point you made about 
a lot of you know people listening to the podcast may feel overwhelmed by us going through all this stuff and certainly at Nink, i think joe and i were both like here's our joe had about fourteen thousand words of notes i was doing mine into my phone and my notes app as a good you know high speed person does <laughs> but because i usually just try to grab the couple things that really stand out to me that i don't already know but there were a lot, a lot of tips and um I think we have a couple more questions here, but then next week we're going to do book bub ads, Amazon ads, and all that good stuff. Real marketing focus, so definitely come back for that one. Um, I did want to ask about the last, the craft one. Damon Swade did quite a few, and I, I heard they were great. I chose this year to go more to the marketing stuff, but I might do more craft ones next year. It's always feel like I should be you know, still trying to learn those things, or at least having things that you kind of know in the back of your brain, maybe reemphasized. So you're thinking about them a little bit more. <laughs> um, so he, you hit one to one on making your protagonists shine. Uh, did you get any good tips on that one from that class? Yeah, uh, it was, I also have often been of the opinion, well, I know how to write a story when I'm bad at is advertising. So was, I, I often like focus more on what I can learn about marketing. So, and then I go to a thing like this where it's like, oh, wow, there's a lot to know about craft. Uh, it was incredibly uh, information dense. He was he nonstop talking the entire time and barely got it in under the wire. But uh, some of the best takeaways I took from this were... Um, the following you you want your direction of your character to always be forward lots of people dump in a lot of backstory and backstory is important but backstory should be uncovered by the story as opposed to just in given to the reader so he's his he was saying that like to make a, a character shine everything the character does should be about moving them toward what they're doing uh actions should be with intention so uh, examples he gave was like, you don't want an activity, you want an action. He swam is an activity. He swam away from the shark is an action. And one of them is definitely more interesting than the other. And it's a lot of stuff like that. Uh, he says that like a main character should be the one who's paying attention. Uh, and, and just that is as, as little as you need to do to make that character suddenly the most interesting person in the story. He talks about how like a stage trick is if you want the audience to look in a direction, you have everyone on stage look in that direction. So if the, if you want the audience to be interested in something that's in a story, you have to have someone in the story paying attention to that thing. And it should be your main character. Um, he talks about how uh, everything should be moving toward a stated aim. Uh, you don't just want to get the interest of your readers. You want to get the curiosity of your readers because interest means that they're looking what's on the page. Curiosity means they're creating things inside their own heads, which is making the story unique to them. Like the phrase he uses was, you're going to provide the grit and they're going to create the pearl. So a lot of it is the stories what's taking place in between the actions. And your job is just to create interesting actions that are intelligently connected and then uh, let the audience put together a much better story, much more personal story than you could ever write for them in their own heads. He threw out a lot of words that I'd never heard before, like Xenia. Xenia is uh, uh, grace. It's the thing that makes a hero a hero. I'd never heard the phrase used. And he talks about how um, a hero is defined by the fact that they always have Xenia. Everything that they're doing, it doesn't have to be, oh, Mr. Goody Two Shoes, but everything they're doing is done just with a general. You know, it's what it's what allows us to have a society, and the hero always embodies that. They, you know, they're the one who pets the cat. They're the one who helps the person who fell down. And this is something that I've grappled with in the past, and it's a useful advice. Every now and then, a side character seems like it's stealing the story from the main character, and a way that you can you can tamp that down is to have that set character falter in their xenia. Have them step on an old lady's foot is the example he gave. Just a little thing that a hero wouldn't do, and instantly the uh, audience is going to refocus on the hero as the primary source uh, of, of interest. And uh, also, and you know, the last point on it, but obviously uh, the villain certainly is someone who should also be paying attention, but the villain is the one who lacks grace, who lacks the Xenia. The villain is the one who, when push comes to shove, always does the thing that's counter to society and, and more toward themselves. And, and so like that should be fairly obvious, but the idea that like, whereas the hero can never fully violate Xenia, your villain can never fully embrace it or else it confuses the, the audience. So there's a lot like, it really just boiled down to a lot of little things where it's just like the audience should be doing a lot more work. Your job is just to give them the tools to tell the interesting story to themselves. 
Now I'm sitting here thinking my per my current series really follows that rule well with the hero being like a rogue, noble, morally upright guy and the villain being, he's, you know, has his reasons and he's not really a total villain. But um, I feel like, I don't know, I feel like often the audience, maybe depending on the genre, is a little more drawn to the edgier character that's maybe not as nice, especially in like something like urban fantasy where that's sarcastic. Like I feel like they often have a redeeming quality, but boy, I, I've picked up some stuff where character's really edgy and you're, you're kind of like, if you're looking for that moral hero, that might not be there. But I guess it's an example of knowing the rules and then deciding if you're going to break them for a reason. Right. He actually had a big chunk. He had another word that I'd never heard of before, uh, uh, where uh, it was it was talking about how basically there's like an impishness to any character that's actually interesting. And again, if you were the only character paying attention, you're going to be isolated and you're going to therefore be more interesting. But uh, uh, yeah, it's... It, it sort of comes into that where the main character is going to be volatile and that's like really the interesting thing comes from they're going to be in positions that puts two forms of grace at odds with each other. There's going to be a decision that they have to make that is either better for one person or better for the society. So it really does come down to balancing. Uh, uh, you know, well, he, he was saying it really comes down to balancing the, the more difficult, the choice that they have to make and the it's situations that like, are you going to be the snarky jerk or is this the moment where you're going to let the grace shine through? Like it all, it, it, it all mixes together into a big pot. Did he say anything about um, protagonists driving the action? Cause I feel like as a reader, that's where I, you lose me really quickly. If your protagonist is just along for the ride and the interesting things are happening to the other people in the story or they're, they're kind of driving it. I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. He was very clear that your, your protagonist, uh, they should they should always everything they do should be moving them toward their stated goal and uh, nothing they do should not be moving them toward that stated goal and it got down to the point where he was like you should be defining every choice made by your character as you know so and so is as a character who pays attention like it was, he was he broke it down into an actual sentence phrase you just fill in the names of your character and what they do and if you and if you find yourself without uh, a thing to fill in into that sentence, then that whole thing should be removed. Like that action be removed. So it's like, you know, Willy Wonka is a candy maker who pays attention to the way people act so that he can change the, the status quo and blah, 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 blah. Like, and so that, yeah, he was very clear. The motion is always forward. If they're passive at all, then they are a member of the audience. They're not the main character. So you went to a class that was called the art to fiction keywords. Um, this is Dave Chesson, right? Yes. Okay. So is this a separate class then from the other one that he did then? Yeah, he did two, And they were fairly tightly related, but uh, this came down to like, whereas the, the one we talked in, in detail about earlier was about uh, how you're using keywords to, uh, to, you know, help the algorithm. This was, much more focused on the actual selection of those keywords and the way that they're selected and what they mean and, and how they do it. A lot of the points that were made in terms of uh, uh, relevance. Relevance is, the, is one of the big things that he brought up is when you're trying to choose keywords, you're trying to choose keywords that are relevant to your book and relevance is the most useful of the, of the keyword elements and the one that is going to affect the algorithm the most. So uh, like this is where we start talking about how if you fill in all 50 uh, characters of your keyword slot with, with words, uh, those words will all contribute to the keywords that people will be able to find your thing for, but they'll also score much lower. And, uh, and, and more to the point, choosing keywords that people actually purchase uh, is so much more important than choosing just keywords that people will search for. So he had lots of graphs, but what it basically comes down to is there's a limit to the amount that you can, there's a limit to the, to the uh, level of relevancy you can get to just by having a wide interspersed bunch of things that people might search for. Yeah, that, basically that's what it was. And, and that's where a lot of the same tactics were coming up where it was, uh, if you just enter in your search term uh, and let Amazon fill in more. Uh, and if you, there was a lot of overlap, actually, with the previous thing I think about. It. I'm having difficulty. All of this stuttering is me having difficulty separating the two things in my head. 
All right. Well, should we uh, wrap it up? I guess we've been rambling for an hour and a half, <laughs> um, hour and 10, uh, 15 minutes, something like that. You guys can see why we split it up and you can see why there were three days worth of full talks. And there's some that Joe and I didn't even get to. Uh, there's a lot. There were usually three things going on at one time. So you had to pick. Uh, one thing I didn't mention at the beginning that I just wanted to mention as kind of an overall vibe I got from talking to a lot of people there is that here as we are in 2019, we've got a lot of authors that have been in the business for a while and some that, you know, there was lots of like seven figure authors there. People have seen huge success. Everybody seems a little concerned about like, it's getting harder. It's more competition. It's hard. It's, you know, you're having to spend more on ads to make as much as you did last year when you barely spent as much on ads. So if you're getting that vibe and feeling that, you know, I don't necessarily have an answer to you for you, but just know that a lot of people were feeling that. Um, I think, going forward, you know, it'll be really important to kind of nurture your fan base and write to a really specific audience that only you and your style, you know, your voice can quite give them what they want. I think that's the kind of thing that will allow people to survive when there's 50 bazillion of whatever in your market, <laughs> you know, and it's all the categories have been packed on Amazon and the other stores and, you know, and there's going to be more opportunities coming forward too. Like I said, audiobooks are coming on if that's something you're interested in, you know, we're seeing more opportunities still, but, um, just realize that, yeah, everybody's kind of feeling like, okay, it's not easy anymore. You really got to <laughs> fight if you want to keep what you had or, you know, succeed going forward. Do you guys have any final thoughts before we wrap up? Um, I will say that, uh, as Andrew was saying, it's an excellent point to make. You just got an awful lot of information and that information that you just got is a subset of all the information we got. And it seems like an awful lot. Um, when people actually ask me, like not in terms of summarizing thoughts like this, but just, hey, what, did you, what were your big takeaways? There were like three big ones and we're probably going to talk about all three of them next to, in, the, in the next episode. But like it all boils down to just a three, like you, you instinctively know, oh, that's something I know enough about to start right now. And it seems like it's something that I've never thought of before. Uh, so don't look at all this and say, I, this is, these are all things I need to do. Just, this is a situation where focus is important. And, uh, if something doesn't work now, that list of things you can do, just pick the next one off that list so don't feel like all of this is an instantaneous imperative. Yeah. And don't, uh, don't flail. I know that happens a lot. I mean, I do it a lot because I don't have as much writing time, but listen to the episode and pick things that resonate with you and focus on one or two things. Don't focus on everything because the more you split your attention, the more basically the less effective you'll be. And you're, you're basically setting yourself up for failure. And so you need pick something that, you know, resonates with you and might resonate well with your audience and then focus on that as much as you can until it's, you know, until you prove whether it's going to work for you or not, give it an honest effort basically. And I would love, I'll eventually go to Nink. Um, I just, right now, like right now, I just go to that business masterclass and I focus on my kids, but someday. <laughs> it's a little easier to go one state away than uh, across the country. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, same thing. I think my takeaway is uh, I have a huge list. A lot of it will just be like, as I'm launching the next book, you know, like maybe I'll put a little more effort into the keywords. And there's a couple of tips we'll talk about next week that, just little things that I can start doing with my advertising. So I, I always put the focus on writing the next book though. You cannot go wrong unless you're not selling any books, at which point you need to figure out how to sell some books. <laughs> but if you're, you know, may having some success already, keep doing some more of what you're doing and then try to each launch, you know, try to try a few new things and try to learn how to do it better. I'm always <laughs> trying to get better with the advertising. Um, and if you did not get enough of the Ning talk, I just wanted to, I just listened to um, Nathan Van Koops did a sum up on his podcast too. And you can check that out. I, I grabbed the link. He's actually puts it out through a Facebook group, but it's also on iTunes. It's called Book Faces. Book Faces Live, I believe is the name of the show. If you want to search for that. But um, he does some good stuff too. So anyway, that is it from us. Thank you for listening. And we hope you got something out of this long <laughs> show. Please visit sixfigureauthors.com with the number six for the show notes to leave a comment or to ask a question for a future show. And now that we are officially live and up on iTunes, if you have time to pop in and leave a review, that would really help us out since we're starting from scratch here with this new show. And we hope people find it and find it useful. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.